Okay, our next speaker is Matt Wright, and he'll talk about thermodynamic metrics on the outer space. Okay, uh, so I always start off by uh, thanking the organizers, Chris, Claude, and Wave Hi and Tara, who's watching this later on. Um, she promised me she would watch it, so Tara, I'm holding you to it. Uh, so, um, yeah, I want to talk today about a couple of metrics. I'm really just going to focus on one of them which you can define on the space of uh, mark metric graphs. So this is uh, what's known as the color of open outer space. So the way that the metrics are defined is using the <coughs> notion of entropy. Uh, and so we call this the entropy metric. Um, let's see, so uh, to study the, the, the metric to actually make some calculations, we have to use some tools that uh, arise from the thermodynamic formalism, which was developed by Bowen, Ruel, uh, Perry, and Polycott. Uh, so that's the, the name of the title there. Um, but um, part of the, the motivation here for um, studying this metric and thinking about it uh, arises from, from surfaces. It's a common strategy when uh, trying to study um, outer space to uh, sort of look at the situation that's going on in surfaces. Um, and the motivation here for studying this metric comes from a, a result of McMullen. So the, the construction of this metric, you can also do the same construction uh, in the world of, uh, of surfaces. And on type Muller space, McMullen proved that this metric um, um, which I'll again just call the, the entropy metric, um, is proportional to the main Peterson metric. So on type, uh, on type Muller space, uh, McMullen proved that the entropy metric is proportional, so it's four-thirds times the area of the surface, of the hyperbolic structure on the surface, times the phase theater symmetry. Okay? So, um, yeah, the thought here of studying this metric was to get some sort of a Bay peterson analog for a metric on our space. Okay. All right, so let me just sort of uh, begin by um, setting some notation and telling uh, you know, what our space is in case you don't know. Um, maybe a little preview for next week for those of you that are staying. So uh, let f be a figure <coughs> of rank r. Uh, always at least two. Uh, no infinite type three groups here. <laughs> uh, and then um, r will just be a rose. So just a graph with r petals. Um, our edges on it, um, and we'll fix that isomorphism uh, from the fundamental group of R uh, to our group. Okay. okay, and so like I said, the uh, color of open outer space is the uh, space of Mark metric graphs. Um, so denote this by X of uh, the free group. Um, and you can really think of a point here in outer space really as a triple. Okay. So you can think of it really as a triple of things. So gamma is a finite graph. So a finite graph uh, without a valence one or valence two vertices. Uh, L is a link function. So it's just a function from the set of edges uh, to the positive numbers. Okay. Which you can think, right, just assigns a link to each one of the edges. Right? So I'll call these a link function. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the homotopy equivalence rho uh, from uh, the rows uh, to the graph. <coughs> Okay, which is called the marking. Uh, and then there's some um, natural equivalence here that uh, won't be necessary for us to consider. Um, and in fact, most of the times, um, the, the marking won't play such a, such a key role. So the metric is really just defined locally. And so I can really just work uh, in uh, sort of a single <coughs> mark graph. Okay. Right, yeah, so this is the uh, color of open outer space. plays you know, a similar role in the study of the outer automorphism group of a free group that the type Miller space does uh, for the mapping class. Okay, so like I said, the, the metric we'll define is really defined locally. So if I fix um, you know, a finite graph and I fix my marking, 
But really, I just have this thing about this base of length functions, and then really this is just a cone, right? So this thing about this is just functions from the edges, right? So this is just positive rails, right? To the, um, right? Just think of these as right? well, what it is, right? <laughs> this open cone, right? Or this uh, orthant there in, uh, in Euclidean space, right? So this is the, the set of length functions on gamma. Okay. All right. So there's a, an action of, of R plus on, on outer space, the way I defined it, just by a, a scaling the length function. Right? You just take the whole metric on the graph and you just blow it up or you shrink it down. Okay. And it's a, a common practice um, in studying outer space to pick you know, some orbit representatives for that action. In other words, pick some sort of normalization. Right? You want some sort of normalization there so that um, to get rid of that, that R plus action. Uh, so a, a common uh, normalization, uh, when it was originally defined, this is the one that was used, and a common normalization is, is, is to normalize by volts. So um, what's this? So I'll denote this uh, with the CV, or color of open. This is really how it appeared um, originally. Um, But, so just take these triples, right, so the mark metric graphs, uh, but normalize or restrict to the, the subspace here where the sum of the length of edges equals to 1. Right, this is what's called the volume. So are you allowing valence 1 or valence 2 vertices? No, no, no. I said that, but I didn't write it. I'll find that. So. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, the, you know, part of the motivation for... Uh, the normalization by volume, right, comes from the fact that, uh, you know, for a hyperbolic surface, the area is just completely determined by the topology. Okay. All right, um, and so again, you know, um, this will sort of come up later, so, all right, CV of gamma, I just mean that, um, you know, the intersection here, the, the, the link functions of um, volume one, right, so just think, um, you know, all the link functions on gamma intersected here with this volume one. Okay, um, and well, what is this? I mean, it's just uh, topologically it's a disk, but you can think of it as a, as an open simplex. Right, so it's an open simplex of uh, dimension, uh, well, number of edges minus one. Right, you're just intersecting this uh, ortho here, you know, with the plane sum of coordinates. Okay, so um, let me draw a picture then. Uh, example, if you've never seen one. So if I want to look at uh, you know link functions here on, on a theta graph, well I'll get a, a two-dimensional open simplex. And I'll draw it here actually including the edges, um, but not the vertices. I'll say why here in just a second. Alright, so I think of um, Varying the length of the edges on my theta graph, requiring that the volume equals to one, right? It's going to move here around inside of this um, inside of this this uh, open two simplex. And when I collapse one of the edges, well, the, the graph that I get is, is just a rose, and we'll see three roses here then on the, the boundary of this. Right, collapsing the red edge moves us over here, collapsing the blue and green and so forth. Okay. So this is a small little picture there of what's going on inside of outer space. And the way you can think about you know, the rest of outer space is you know, starting from this picture, from this little rose here, you can think right if you sort of grow, grow that rose like this, it'll move you into to this simplex. But if instead you did a little twist and, and grew it out, you'd really be changing the marking and you move into a, a, a simplex for a theta graph over here. Likewise, so you have all of these sort of triangles um, floating around, coming from, you know, shrinking an edge, doing a little twist. Okay. And then there's another one that pops up here as well, too, right? I could take the two things and pull them apart. And that gives a barbell graph, which will also be a two simplex that's kind of hanging out. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so um, to define the, the metric here, I don't want to look at the, the, the volume normalization. Instead, I want to normalize by metric. Okay? Um, and this also makes sense, um, you know, if you think about this from the uh, world of surfaces, the um, entropy of the topological, sorry, topological entropy of the geodesic flow on a surface, on a hyperbolic surface, is always one. Okay? So we're going to normalize by entropy and consider graphs where that, where that entropy is also equal. Okay, so let me give uh, a definition of entropy then. Um, <coughs> that's a little bit uh, easier to digest for someone like me that does geometric group theory. Um, so we're going to look at a collection of uh, cycles on the graph, or sorry, circuits. Okay, so just, you know, um, reduced, immersed, you know, edge paths that, that close up. So that's a circuit on, on the graph. Okay. And then the, the entropy then of the limit function. Um, is defined by uh, taking the, um, the exponential growth rate of the number of geodesics of a certain size. Well, really taking log of that. So it's defined as the limit as L goes to infinity of 1 over L log number of uh, circuits on the graph whose length using this uh, length function is less than or equal to L. Okay. So that's the, the uh, entropy of the length function. Um, just counting the number of geodesics of a given length, um, looking at the really log of the exponential growth rate <coughs> of the number of geodesics. Okay. So there's an even, uh, at least for me, a better way of thinking about this. Um, it's more accustomed to things that I've seen before. So uh, alternatively, rather than counting uh, closed paths, what I can do is I can, you know, Take the um, metric structure on L, and I can uh, look at a universal cover. That will give me some tree with some distance function on it. Okay. And then the entropy, you can also uh, compute this, again, looking at a limit as L goes to infinity, 1 over L. Uh, but now you're just going to count, oh, sorry, I should also fix a point here. That's in the tree. And I'm just going to count how many vertices lie in a ball of radius L about this point. Okay? And that's an, uh, also a, way, a fine way of there thinking of the entropy. Right? I mean, the point is, is that you know, counting these vertices is essentially just like you know, counting paths. And any path will, will close up to a circuit with, uh, with a bounded length. So it's really the same thing if you're thinking about Counting the vertices here in the tree, or if you're counting uh, times. Okay. Is there a log? Oh, there is a log. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so with this, I mean, right now. <coughs> Uh, for instance, if you take the, the length function on the rows, say the R rows, that you know, just assigns 1 to everything, uh, well then that entropy uh, is log of 2R minus 1. Okay? And the way to, to think about this, right, I mean, at least if you look about the, the Cayley graph, right, you're just counting how many vertices uh, live in a ball of a certain radius about the identity, right? And there's you know two to the so sorry two r minus one ways of, of extending that ball out. Okay? So that's how we get the entropy there is exactly the log of two r minus one. Okay. Um, an observation here is that um, entropy is homogeneous of degree minus one. All right, if I make the, the metric bigger, then I'm going to have uh, fewer circuits of a given length. 
Yes, uh, you know, I mean, like the number of vertices on a, on a given level is approximately, you know, two to the r to that level. Because every every time you step out, you get two to the r. I mean, every vertex gives you two to the r minus one. Okay. Um, so what is this? I mean, so when I write this down, well, I mean, it tells you that um, you know, along any any ray, and uh, in the cone over here, you'll get every value of entropy exactly one. But we're going to normalize then so that the entropy equals 1. Um, on this x1, f. So this is just the mark metric graphs. Right, where the entropy is equal to 1. Okay. Um, yeah, so this was first uh, written down by uh, Polycott and Sharp. <coughs> okay, and again, you know, if I look at, say, just a fixed marked graph, I uh, intersect that here uh, with the entropy one matrix. Right, so that's entropy one metrics then on that on that fixed graph. Okay. And again, uh, I mean this thing is um, you know this will be homeomorphic to um, you know what we had before uh, the, in the in the in the volume normalization. In fact, this thing is just homeomorphic to um, the volume normalization also. Okay. Yeah, so this thing is again just an open simplex. Well, maybe just write it as this. Doesn't look like a simplex anymore. Okay. All right. So um, yeah, this is the the, the normalization we're going to work with here. We're going to put a metric on this space. Okay. Um, so I need a, a theorem here. I can use entropy to define a metric. Um, so this is a special case of a, a much more general theorem here. Um, so in general, this was considered a much broader framework by Perry and Polycott. Um, paper 90. Um, McMullen uh, proved just in this case that I'm going to write down here in a second um, in 2014. And the theorem is that the entropy function is uh, real analytic and strictly convex. then to define a, a metric on a, on a okay? So the real analytic right tells me I can take derivatives. Um, and X tells me some positive values. So now I'm going to go ahead and define then um, the entropy metric. Okay, and it'll be a, a Ramanian metric in, uh, in, in, in each of the simplices. Right? So I just need to tell you an inner product here. So given a pair of tangent vectors, B and W, tangent vectors at L, and this set of entropy one metrics. And I mean, what I mean here by tangent vectors, I mean the fact that you know this function is um, you know, real analytic, right? Tells me that you know in a given simplex, you know this is just a codimension one submanifold, right? So when I'm talking about a tangent vector, I mean the way that you, you talk about tangent vectors and you know like your multivariate calculus class, right? Think about this as you know some surface sitting inside of you know, this cone, and you're really just taking you know something that that you know will tangent to it, right? Okay, but yeah. So I mean, you should think of these things as I mean, you should think of these things as vectors, um, you know, in R to the a number of x. Okay. 
Right. Okay. Okay, so given a couple of tangent vectors, let me write down a formula that won't tell you anything, but at least I can say I wrote down a formula. Um, so what's the uh, what's the metric? What's the inner product here? Well, I'm just going to use the Hessian of entropy. to uh, write down um, an inner product. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is the Hessian, right? So in other words, the matrix of second derivatives. Okay. <coughs> All right, All right. And so real analytic, right, tells me this thing is, you have the second derivatives. And the strict convexity, right, is what's necessary to see that, you know, this thing is actually um, going to give me a metric. Okay? Perfect, that's what it is. I can go home now, right? Um, now let me tell you something about it. Yeah, so let me write down a, um, maybe a first observation here that will be important later on. Um, uh, make it a little bit easier to, to work with this. Um, so if, um, suppose I have some smooth path. In the set here of entropy one metrics on, graph, on, on gamma, right? Well, then, right, I mean, that just means that, you know, the entropy along here is constant, and so if I differentiate this twice, okay. Can I what? It's why, just from the definition, I can't see why it's positive definitely. Uh, this is strictly convex. Uh, so if you differentiate this twice, you see that you can look at the norm of a tangent vector. Right? Uh, you can write this down um, by taking the second derivative of the path um, and dotting this with the gradient of a uh, the minus. If you differentiate this statement twice, you'll get that that's equal to the thing over there. This will be important later on um, because, um, yeah, we look at some paths, and if I know that I can change the length of an edge essentially in a, in, in a linear way, then that tells me this norm is going to be very small. Okay? So linear changes of edges, if you can do it, you can't inside of the space, right, because it's positive definite, but if you can change your edges in, in, a, in a linear way, then it's going to Okay, so that's the... The, the metric, like I said, um, if you do this construction in the world of, say, uh, you know, constant curvature surfaces, um, if Mullen proves you get something uh, which is proportional to the Peterson metric. Um, so the, the question is, um, you know, how does this compare? How does the entropy metric on outer space compare to the Bay Peterson metric? Well, uh, so let me uh, start here with uh, one theorem about this. Um, showing, oh, yeah, or sorry, I should say some more names here before I get going on here. Um, so this metric, um, so not this exact metric. Like I said, there are really two metrics. I said metrics in my title, although this is the one I'm going to talk about. There's, there's another way to um, sort of use some of these tools from the thermodynamic formalism to also uh, define a metric. Um, which uh, yeah. you can ask me about it later. It's, it's been formal to this one, um, but we're going to focus on, on this one. But that one was really first defined by uh, uh, Polycott and Sharp. Um, and then the, this metric here, the entropy metric, was, was first uh, written down um, uh, by Cal.
Okay. So, yeah, theorem about comparing the entropy metric to the Peterson metric on Peck Miller space. Um, so, there's a theorem here uh, in the paper by uh, Polycott and Sharp um, called the random geodesic theorem. smooth path here, um, and the, the theorem really says that the, the norm of the tangent vector here, um, you can measure this by looking at how the length of a random g-decimal is. So let L of t, L sub t be, the, be smooth, um, and um, we call this L of little L sub t, L sub zero uh, be the length in L sub t of a random geodesic on L naught. Um, so what do I mean by this? Well, there's some, um, there's some measure on the space of uh, geodesics associated to one of these points, uh, which is called the equilibrium state. Um, so you take some sequence of geodesics, uh, which become uniformly distributed with respect to that measure, and then you just measure um, the ratio of their length in LT divided by the, the length in L0. Um, or if you like, um, you can think of that measure as a current, if you're comfortable thinking about currents, um, and then really this is just um, the uh, uh, kapovich lustig intersection. Well, yeah, L0 is the real point. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about the uh, length of the tangent vector at L0. Um, so then uh, the statement says that the second derivative of a uh, log length of the random geodesic um, is the norm of the tangent vector. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned this. The theorem here, um, Wolpert uh, proved a, a similar characterization uh, for the Bay-Peterson metric about the Bay-Peterson norm. Uh, you can you know, compute that again using, you know, looking at the uh, uh, the, the length of a, a random genus of Okay. Um, we're going to use some slides here in a minute. It's all warm. It takes a while. Let's get that warmed up. Okay. Okay, so let me write down uh, our <coughs> result here. What was the point of the formula of that? Why do you write it down? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> this, this here? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, later on, I'll, I'll want to say something about, well, I can change an edge in a linear fashion, so this is. So the point of seeing this is that if I can change an edge in a linear way, then this norm is zero. So if you can change something in almost just linear, one, that's like a shortcut. One. Just one edge, any edge is changing linear. No, 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 no. If, if all, all the edges are changing in a linear. Yeah, yeah. So the second derivative advantage of that. So if I can, I mean, you can't do that, right? Because this thing is positive definite. But so you the can. So point is that the norm of h is, the gradient of h is zero, because h is one, no? What do you mean? The gradient of h is oh, not zero. Really it's, like, it's, it's normal, right? That's right. Yeah, so the point of this, yeah, maybe we'll be clear a little later on. If I can change something in a linear way, that's zero. Okay? Okay. Okay, so, um, yeah, so one of the things about the uh, AP or symmetric that I've already been mentioned this week is that it's, it's incomplete. Um, so that's one of the first things uh, to investigate with this metric. Um, let me write this uh, the theorem of um, a parrot. Uh, so, I, 
uh, which says, um, well, so the first statement's a little different. Um, if r equals 2, then the entropy metric is complete. So if r equals 2, the metric is complete, uh, and for a bigger r, it's not complete. Okay, oh, perfect. It's warming up right now. Um, and I should, yeah, so uh, that's our theorem, right, that it's complete for r equals 2 and not complete for um, Higher rate. I should say that there were there were calculations done by Polycott and Sharp and also Cow um, in in rank two, seeing you know some some simplices that that looked complete, and some simplices that were not. Polycott, Sharp, and also Cow. Um, uh, some calculations. Um, I think I should give a description of the completion. Wait two minutes? Isn't that what you're supposed to tell Andy here? <laughs> okay. Okay, so yeah, so let me go ahead and uh, explain sort of a picture of what's going on here and um, explain to you how you should think about uh, points that you can reach to in the finite time. So, um, so, so I'm looking at the rows, right? The only thing I'll write on the chalkboard here. So the pedal's A, B, C, right? So the space of length functions, right, is just the, you know, the orthant there in R3. Um, there's the um, standard volume normalization, right? You're just looking at the uh, plane A plus B plus C equals 1 as it crashes through there. Okay, um, and that's the entropy normalization. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Um, there's the defining equation up there on the top. If you're curious, um, but I mean, uh, yeah. So I mean, I only draw a portion of it, right? I mean, it really continues on all along these these axes here, right? Because it hits every single ray um, in the in that in that orbit. Um, and you know, as you move out, you know, sort of as C becomes small and you move out here in this plane A and B, I mean, this thing starts to become, you know, like um, uh, asymptotic to the coordinate plane. Okay, but you see that curvature there uh, right in the middle. Okay, so that's what this thing is. All right, and uh, I didn't show you what the um, what the moduli space looks like uh, for the two rows, uh, but if I did, you might look at this curve there. Oh, I have a point, right? You might look at this curve there and say, wow, Matt, that looks a lot like the uh, moduli space of, of the two rows. And uh, well, you'd be correct. It does look a lot like it. Um, so it looks like here on the edge here that you have something that's approaching the, the moduli space there of, of the two rows. Uh, really, you can think of the two rows there on, uh, on the pedals B and C. Okay. Uh, and you can do a, a calculation here. Um, and if you look at uh, some entropy one metric on, on the two rows on B and C, so that's what uh, the B naught and the C naught are, just fix your favorite entropy one metric on the two rows, um, and you take this path uh, and you know the moduli space here for the three rows, and this is going to necessarily blow um, A of S up to infinity, because as the entropy is you know going to be concentrated on B and C, you know if A, if A of S stays positive, the entropy is going to be too big, right? So A of S has to blow up. Okay. And so that you know cruises you out here to you know sort of the edge of the space. Um, and if you do a calculation here, you can compute that the, the norm of the tangent vector along this path uh, looks like one over the square root of this. Okay. And if I integrate from you know something to zero, uh, the function one over the square root of s, right? That's a convergent integral. Okay. So you can get to all of these points here, um, you know, fixing your favorite entropy one metric on uh, the rows on B and C. You can get to any of those points in, in finite time. Okay, right? You set, you know, uh, A equal, but you blow up A, pick your favorite metric, and it goes to that point. 
Right? Likewise, you know, the same thing for the other side as well, too. Right? Okay? So there's also, you know, you can get to any point over there with the entropy metric on A and C and any point of entropy metric on A and C. Okay. Okay, so, um, well, so you have sort of these three sides here. What about the corners? There we go. So if you try to look at a corner, what's going on here? So this is really where um, B and C are blowing up, and so A is shrinking down, right? B and C is getting really big, so in order to keep entropy one, A has to get extremely tiny. Uh, and if you look at this path that just you know literally blows up B and C, you can compute its norm, and you see that the norm looks like one over the square root of t. But of course the domain's different here, right? Now I'm integrating from something finite to infinity, um, and so this. Um, Diverges, right? So the length of this path is infinite. Uh, and if you work a little harder, you can in fact see that any path that is going to limit onto um, something worth blowing up B and C necessarily has infinite length. Okay? So I mean this particular path has that same behavior, but again, any path that goes out there essentially the, the norm of the vector is going to look like one over the square root of the second shortest edge. Um, so since that has to be blowing up, we're going to be integrating something like that. Okay? Okay, so the, the completion here uh, for the moduli space here of the three rows, right? So we have these three sides here corresponding to the entropy one metrics on the, the, the three subgraphs, uh, A, B, B, C, and A, C. Um, but then the um, corners there, uh, there's, there's nothing there. Okay. Um, so here's sort of a, a schematic picture of what's going on here. So it's this one on the right here. I'll talk about this thing on the left in a second. But the one on the right, right, is how you can sort of think of this completion, right? Um, is that, you know, you have up top here, you think about you know B is blown up to infinity, um, and then you can pick any entropy one metric on A and C and so forth. So the, the picture there on the left um, is what happens if you close it up in the length function to quality. So this is if you work with the volume normalization that I wrote down before, and you just close up that simplex. Um, I mean, if you don't know the length function topology, you just close up the simplex like you wanted to close up that picture, right? Just draw the uh, intersection where the uh, you know some of the coordinates are equal to zero. Okay, um, and and there, in fact, I mean, I drew these things sort of, uh, you know, one's upside down from the other because really this, there's this duality that's going on here, right? So um, in order to, uh, oh, I'll go ahead. in order to like approach this point here, right, you had blow C up to infinity, and then A and B are going to you know collapse down to something. But projectively, I mean, over here you can't blow C up to infinity, right? Because the length of any edge is at most one, right? So projectively, how do you blow C up? Is you make A and B go to zero. Okay? And so you make A and B go to zero, and then you really only have one parameter left, and that's C. And so really, the, um, these points here, right, all these paths here that will limit onto these different paths in the entropy metric, in the closure of the link function topology, they all you know, go to this one point here, which corresponds to this graphic group C composition. Okay. And then likewise, there's this missing point over here in the corner, right, which corresponds to, you know, you can think like B and C blow up to infinity, and A goes to, um, A goes to zero, right? Well, again, you can't send B and C, you know, off to um, infinity. But by sending A and A to zero, B and C can just be anything, right? And so, really, you get this sort of one-dimensional thing here, corresponding to parameterizing these graphic group decompositions. Okay. And so, I mean, you sort of see this dual. I mean, right. So, I mean, the closure is, you know, something like a simplex missing its vertices, but it's, you know, sort of a, the dual simplex of what you get when you do the length function. Uh, closure. Okay. Is that good? So I'm going to pull the slides up. Anyone want to see more pictures? I think so cute. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the, the picture that, um, that you had there for the completion for that three rows, right? It's a, the two simplex missing its vertices. And in fact, we can prove that that's the right picture for all roses. So here's our next theorem. Oh, sure. So I should say sort of heuristically. <coughs> you should think of the points in the completion, the points you can reach in finite time, as really entropy one metrics on subgraphs.
right? So that's why I was able to reach like an entropy one metric on the on the rows, you know, on A and B. But I couldn't just. I mean, there is no entropy one metric on a cycle, right? So that's why I can't limit onto a metric on just a single cycle because there's no entropy one metric. Right? So that's why that cycle at A, right, where I blow up B and C, really has infinite distance. Okay. So the theorem. <coughs> Uh, is the following, so the completion, the entropy completion, of entropy one metrics on the R rows um, is homeomorphic uh, to the complement of the vertices in an R minus one simplex. So I mean, you have to do some calculation there to you know estimate the, the norms of you know some of the, these lengths of the paths. Do the calculation showing that you know you can reach any entropy one metric on a subgraph. Um, and this, yeah. Are we supposed to be this heuristic just for the rows or for graphs? No, for for graphs in general. Okay, but then just trying. <laughs> two minutes, all. Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Uh, maybe if you're me and not like Saul, it may take you a little while to, to see uh, the problem that's about to arise. Um, so let me go ahead and write down the next theorem. Maybe Saul has already anticipated. And uh, the following theorem um, says that um, the entropy metric on outer space, so all of outer space here, um, entropy one metrics in outer space, um, for R at least four is bounded. Okay? So the whole thing, right? Not a single simplex, I mean the whole thing. Is... Or is it, what? Bounded diameter? Bounded diameter. Oh. Yeah. So, um, or as Dan wanted me to sell this, the entropy metric on outer space is delta hyperbolic. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, well, let me go ahead and in the last. Yeah, I've got enough time. Um, let me tell you what uh, sort of the source of um, the degeneracy here. So I guess Saul already saw. Actually, let me put it right now. Yeah, and the problem is exactly um, disconnected subgraphs. <coughs> Which you know that the rest of them have. Um, right? Because what's the entropy if you had a disconnected graph? Well, really, it's just the max of the entropies of the components. Okay? So it's really just the max of the entropies of the components. So as long as one of those components that I'm limiting onto has entropy 1, I'm free to do whatever I want to with the other one. In particular, I can change everything in a linear way at zero speed. So this is sort of the problem. Um, so if I take this graph gamma, uh, which is a double barbell, um, let me sort of draw you a picture here and what you might think is the completion well, about some graphs that you can get to in finite time. Um, that's really, like, like I said, I mean, you might think that in the completion here, you'd see sort of a whole moduli space corresponding to entropy one subgraphs, just, you know, on um, A and B. But let me in fact show you that this whole thing in fact collapses to a point. Right? So if you take, say, an entropy one graph over here where A is very tiny and B is big, and then down here you have an entropy one graph where A is big and B is tiny, let me show you a path then in the space that connects these things that has arbitrarily short distance. Okay. So the, the, the way to do this is, um, well, think about a link function here. And, uh, really going to send you know, that other edge e off to infinity. 
So really, I'm sort of working already in you know sort of the completion here. Um, but there's a path then from the, the metric here, which has you know, that entropy one metric on A and B, you know any entropy one metric on C and D. And this path here, which just has A and B constant, um, and C and D you know go off to infinity in a linear way, <coughs> that has zero length. Right, so I mean, you might argue this is not actually in the moduli space, right? But you can sort of take this whole picture and sort of push it inside in a little bit to get a path between, you know, some points there that are arbitrarily uh, short distance. Okay? So this thing has zero length, right? This was that comment before, right? So I could, if I can change C and D in a linear way, then that's zero length, right? Well, I can do the same thing then over here, right? So now I have this A, B, and then, you know, here's my favorite entropy one metric on C and D. Okay? But now since both these have measure B1, I can now fix C and D and let A and B just go off to whatever I want to, right? So I can maybe, you know, have two really big loops over here. Right? So this one is the same metric. Right? So here, you know, um, you know, A grows, you know, linear, you know, A gets bigger in a linear way. Uh, you know, B, C, and D constant. And you do the same thing here. Um, but you now, you know, A, C, and D are constant, uh, and B is linear. Um, and the same thing, right? Since I'm really changing these things in a linear way, that norm is zero, right? So this is really a path, then, in the completion that has zero limit. So this whole thing really gets collapsed to a point. Okay? It's really just a single point in the completion corresponding to that whole, you know, set of entropy one uh, metrics. On, on that thing. Okay. And so, um, what is it <coughs> telling you then, right? Right? I mean, you also sort of see entropy one metrics of this subgraph. You know, appearing. You know, if you were going to look like take the rows on the four of things, A, B, C, and D, right? So what it's saying is that, like, um, you know, in uh, you know the completion here, say in wing four, um, you know, the um, six edges and you know the four missing vertices. In um, you know the completion <coughs> of just the rows uh, are become a point. Okay. So sort of all of those things in that uh, you know that well, if you just took that thing by itself and took it to completion, you get this you know this three simplex minus the vertices. But in fact, inside of the entire space, all of those things just become a single. Yeah, so I mean, this is enough to really collapse down the whole space. I mean, the sort of the picture um, to think about here, um, and it's not the right picture for this metric, but it's in fact the right picture for the other one. Um, but I think it's uh, illustrative. It's really to think about the case of, of rank two. Um, right, so in rank two, right, we like to draw um, outer space like the um, tessellation. Okay, and like I said, right, there's these um, things that come up here corresponding to the barbells. I'll use a different color. Right, so this is, you know, corresponding to a barbell. Right, you'll see that above all of these things. But in the completion, really, every one of these red lines really becomes a single point, right? So it's just collapsing the whole thing, and really what you get is just a wedge of spheres. So all the red stuff.
And that's really sort of what's going on in these higher end things too. You have sort of enough of the stuff that you imagine to be there, you know, that helps you to move around from one subplex to another. That's all getting sort of collapsed into a subplex. Okay, so uh, thank you. The metric might, I mean, it might not be, I mean, um, this thing might not be, yeah, I mean, this is the thing, is that, like, um, those, like, the, uh, the modular space for spinal rows is definitely not isometrically embedded into the, there are shortcuts if you go outside of that, that outside of that sentence. So what happens for RA14 3? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, presumably it's infinite. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why, I mean, you can't do this, this trick, right, because you need, you need two disjoint entropy one subgraphs. But is it like the same as some factor three factor Uh, I, I don't know. Could be. Yeah. It definitely has that feeling of you know like being able to get the subgraphs in, in finite time. So there's no other version of this that could work. We just pick a different sub. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so, yeah, you might want to try to pick a different space to somehow eliminate, I mean, so you, you think, like, why doesn't this happen in type Muller space, right? Because um, if you, in, in type Muller space, right, so, I mean, when you force the entropy to be one in constant curvature surfaces, you're also forcing the curvature to be one, and the curvature is a, is a, is a local condition, right? So when I pinch a curve in, in the in the type Muller space, the metrics on both pieces stays entropy one, because they stay hyperbolic. So this problem here of being able to get to these things in, in finite time where like there's entropy one on one and whatever I want to on the other just doesn't happen um, in, in fact in space. So I mean, you might ask if you could somehow find a, a smaller subset inside of here or something where all of your limiting points have to have entropy one on both pieces, but um, I, mean, I don't know how to do that. <coughs> these, these paths, they're just there. So I mean, yeah. Do you know what the curvature is? Is that negative curvature? Oh, uh, uh, no. Um, and so Polycott and Sharp and also Cow did some calculations um, showing that the, the curvature is uh, positive. Uh, in fact, I mean, you know it has to be, right? Because of Brightson's result. Oh. I mean, so I mean, yeah, so I, mean, I guess it could be simplices for which it's, yeah. 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 Is, is the diameter independent of R? Uh, you know, if we don't have a calculation of the diameter yet. Um, I mean, some of, at some point along the way, we had to use something that something was compact or something. Um, but, uh, Brightson, right, proved that there's no uh, an equivariant non positively curved metric on outer space. Am I correct, right? Am I making this up? On the spine of outer space. On oh, the spine. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, then, take my earlier comment back and address that. <laughs> Any other questions? Let's have uh, time